Well, we are here incredibly for the last panel session of Blister Summit 2024. Unbelievable. Four days, four and a half days uh, of these things. Um, we were just talking about we have an incredibly pro audience right now. Panelists, we're getting there. We still are working out the kinks a little bit, but um, it's been a, a great week of conversations and stories and uh, lots of food for thought in addition to all of that. So um, yeah, very happy with the collective of conversations that have happened uh, throughout this summit. This one's gonna be fun. Uh, we like to call this stories from the field. And uh, so it is story time. And uh, to get things started, um, Hoji, we were skiing the other day and you told kind of an incredible story about your hat. And I would like us to start there, this hat. Okay, this hat, yeah. That's a good story. Yeah. I think, I think, I, I like it. Um, so it would have been, it was right when I was cutting my teeth 20 years ago, I guess. Um, early 2000s, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember the exact year, but I can't, but uh, I got invited to go to Chatter Creek cat skiing operation in the Canadian Rockies, the Western Rockies. It's kind of like a very magical place. Uh, you've seen a lot of content from there over the past couple decades. And uh, it was a still photographer invited me. I was the young guy. He was the, the seasoned veteran uh, snowboard photographer. And uh, yeah, you got to, at that time you had to sled in snowmobile into the, into the lodge. Uh, I think it was like 70 kilometers. I don't know, it's 45 miles or something, 40 miles. Long sled, I had never really snowmobiled. And we were just using uh, the, the, they had like a fleet of sleds, like old Scandix and stuff to haul people in and out. It's pretty rustic back then. And uh, you go, you kind of go in just north of Donald or north of Golden. This little Donald, it's like a kind of a logging center. It's in disrepair, like many things in Canada. And uh, yeah, we slid it in for quite a ways. <laughs> um, and you kind of handrail this uh, the Kinbasket Lake, which is like one of the biggest man-made lakes uh, at the time. I believe when they built the Mica Dam in the late seventies, it was like the second largest. Uh, man-made water p hydropower system in the world. Um, but yeah, you have to kind of handrail this lake and the history of that lake is because they made it and the only thing Canadians can do is just cut down the forest and give you guys the lumber and then buy it back from you for 10 times the cost. Um, yeah, so we can ski a bit too sometimes. But anyway, there's these abandoned tugboats on on the shoreline that it fluctuates heavily the the water level because uh, it's a dam and they'd use tugboats for decades to the lot they would set up logging camps on the other side and bring all like kind of traditional logging when you think they'd tow all these massive collections of, of trees um, and bring them to the Donald and kind of rough process and load them on the trucks and drive them south to you guys. And uh, yeah, we stopped at these abandoned tugboats. It's kind of late in the day and we're shooting some lifestyle stuff and they had been all smashed up. Like they'd been there for a long time at that point. And we, they were kind of like tilted over. It was pretty funny walking around in there. And we started rummaging through. And first thing I found was a pair of like earmuffs from the 70s. And, and this, I don't know if you remember the old, well, the new sleds too, not as bad, but they're so loud. And I was like, this is a jackpot. Like I'm gonna have earmuffs or the, not even halfway. And like, I will actually be able to hear when I get there. And uh, so I snagged those and I think I opened some random drawer and there was this hat in there. Um, and it clearly like, I think it must be from the late 70s, early 80s. Like it's a, a really classic hat. So I snagged that as well. It's not really stealing if someone left it behind, I guess. <laughs> um, and yeah, I hung on to it for up until, I don't think I ever even wore it, probably just in that day or something. And uh, then the Olympics came to, to Whistler 
in, what was that, 2010. So I, I broke it out for the Olympic year. I wanted to represent Canada in free riding, and I did a bunch of shooting in it. And actually got a cover shot of powder with my sunglasses and goggles up doing the hoji thing. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was fun. But, yeah, then I put it away until uh, this winter, earlier in the season, I was up working at the huts where, where I work a lot, um, right on that same lake. And uh, they have a really kind of primitive drying rack above the wood stove. It's a cable system, like just cables kind of strung between a bunch of boards. So it's like MacGyvered. And uh, I had my stuff all on there. And the client, uh, you know, they welcomed the guests to, to dry out stuff when it's wet. And someone went down there half drunk and like slammed their stuff on the other end, bounced my lucky hoji hat, one of a kind Arc'teryx, uh prototype built thing that I've been rocking for about a decade, bounced it on the wood stove, no one knew it was dark or whatever. We're all upstairs getting ready for dinner and I went down to check on the, the wood stove and it was just this horrible smell, just 10 years of hoji sweat, just. <laughs> <laughs> I wore that hat every day for the whole time and, and, and I luckily I went, like it's part of my role as the, the hut keeper, I'm keeping an eye on all the things and I mean that's a Century Lodge 2.0, so the first one burnt down so it's one of the primary uh, objectives we have and yeah I, I pulled the hat off the stove and it was all melting and smoking and, and uh, I was very very sad and then uh, finished. Is this like a history of the world? <laughs> like this is not all yeah. we heard the other day was like I got this hat on an abandoned tugboat. <laughs> <laughs> this, apologies Apologies to the rest of the panelists who okay. won't be speaking this evening. <laughs> no I, more. I get to tell yeah. the, the story of my hat. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting I tell my, my story. Seat. Yeah, but yeah, then I was I, I went I flew over to Austria and I was rummaging through all my old stuff and I found this hat and I'm like this is I got to represent Canada again and it's my only option. So now here I am in America with the Hoji uh, Canadian flag retro hat from the tugboat. <laughs> That, I just started thinking I was in the middle of like a five-part PBS documentary and like we got into like morality and philosophy of finding things and theft and some international politics and like that. I'm exhausted. Um, anyway, I thought it was cool too. that he found the hat on an abandoned tugboat, but I didn't 20 know. 20 years ago. 20 years ago, but I didn't know all the other stuff, so my God. Um, Great story. That's the end of my, I can leave, right? That's no. it? <laughs> I mean, um, T. Tom Brown. Uh, first of all, good luck following that. But this is uh, your first time at the Blister Summit. It's our first time kind of getting to welcome you into the whatever Blister ecosystem or something. And so for you, since, since Hoji's been on like 37 panels now, uh, for you, I think it'd be cool to tell people a little bit more about your background. Um, can we start there? Yeah, sure. Um, my grandma, we'll start back, oh, we way back with my grandma. <laughs> 60 minutes. <laughs> um, yeah, when my grandma was like 20, she lived in Seattle and she just got a random hankering to go skiing. Um, and fell in love with it. And she ended up going like every weekend for a long time at Stevens Pass and ended up teaching her four kids um, to ski and to ski race. Um, so all my mom and my, all my aunts and uncles were all ski racers. Um, and my mom made damn sure that her kids loved skiing too. So her strategy was to uh, take us out of school on uh, sunny powder days and um, yeah and just have us do it and made sure we had a smile on our face and so I learned how to ski at Stevens Pass at like two and a half um, and she put me into ski school until um, I graduated through that then it was ski team and then we were hey, driving what kind of ski team um, race team. Racing. Yeah. I was racing. Um, and then I was like, it was getting to the level where I was kind of competing or I was 
doing it at a higher level. And so my coaches were like, you need to come up and train on Wednesdays and Friday nights. Mm -hmm. And it's like two hours without traffic mm -hmm. to get up there. Um, so my family was kind of like, well, this is a lot. What if we just moved? Um, and I did middle school and high school there and raced. Um, racing was like my life for that period of my life. Um, and I, I had the goal to like be on the US ski team and go to the Olympics and stuff like that. As I got older, I um, started to lose interest in it when I got to be like a senior in high school. I discovered girls and partying and <laughs> it, it became not the, uh, my top priority, I suppose. Um, and then I, I just, I was thinking about college I was like, okay, I want to go to a school that um, is big because I was in a small town and I want to be able to ski a lot. Um, and I had a scholarship before ride to UNR for racing. Mm -hmm. At this point, I still thought I might ski race in college, um, but I really wanted to go to CU. So I, uh, I went to CU and didn't have a scholarship there <laughs> and then quit ski racing anyways. And, but I never like stopped skiing. I took like kind of like a year off or whatever. And someone told me about big mountain ski competitions. I did my first one and fell in love right away. Um, and did those for about five years while I was in college. And then, you know, people would just say like, if you want to be serious about big mountain skiing, you got to go to Jackson Hole. Um, it's, <laughs> kind of like the mecca in the lower 48. I guess another mecca would be uh, Palisades Tahoe as well, but everyone would talk about Jackson. I was like, oh yeah, whatever, big whoop. And then I uh, visited on a trip and it snowed like a foot every day for a week that I was there and it was insane. And I was like, okay, done deal, moving here. Um, so I moved there right after college and was still competing a bit ended up doing like competitions like Kings and Queens of Corbett's. And then I had one season where I was doing the um, FWQ circuit and it just didn't snow like all season pretty much. And it was all hard pack and these young guns were just hucking themselves like 40 feet to hard pack. And I wasn't even that old at the time, but I was like, this sucks. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, so I was like, I'm done competing and um, just started focusing on just shooting my own videos and um, taking photos and producing my own content, um, which I found a lot more fun. And it's kind of cool to be able to like dictate when you work on your stuff and, and try to make sure you're getting soft snow and steep landings and um yeah and then last year i kind of after living in jackson for like six years i decided i wanted to take all my knowledge and experience and skills and put it into one film um centered on the side country around jackson hole uh, and i did that and was super proud with what i came up with and it got a great reception um, landed me some sweet sponsorships and kind of put me where I am here. Cool. Yeah. We'll get back to the uh, side country big lines uh, in a bit. Um, Cody, for all the conversations we've had, I don't know that I've ever asked you. And if you're like, yeah, you have asked me this, but I'm going to a different question. Favorite day in the mountains or favorite ski trip? What comes to mind? Um, it's always <laughs> got my wife's shouting suggestions over here. Yeah. <laughs> he needs so he needs a lot of coaching. I'm gonna, yeah, like listen us out and just say what she says, because <laughs> um, we all know how that goes if I don't. <laughs> um, favorite, you know. The, I get this question a lot, especially with like the 50, what's your best line and whatnot. And it's actually like, I find it really hard to ever answer mm -hmm. that question because you're like, well, 
every day and like so many experiences in the mountains and trips and whatnot are unique and special for so many different reasons, not just snow quality dictating how good that trip was. You know, it's the people, the challenge, the place, the culture, whatever it is can be uh, dictate how memorable of a trip it is. But with all that said, I do say there is one day that was the greatest ski day of my life by far. And it happened in 2010. Um, the story was in the movie, The Way I See It, where I, Mark Abma got hurt, he blew his knee, um, and I ended up getting invited to go back up to Alaska for to film with Matchstick Productions after five years, after I gotten cut from Matchstick Productions because I sucked at skiing so bad, they wouldn't <laughs> let me in their films anymore. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> It was my third trip to Alaska, um, so gaining experience and kind of feeling more confident. I'd just come off of skiing in the Verbier Extreme, so it felt really good, but like flying out on the very first day, I felt like this is your last chance. This is your one opportunity. If you blow this, you're not gonna be a pro skier anymore. And so when you're going up in the helicopter, it's very nerve wracking. Like I always get that feeling when you're in Alaska and it goes blue. Everyone's like, yeah, we're all psyched. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember just like waking up, feeling, seeing the blue and being like, oh fuck. <laughs> like, I'm, <laughs> I'm about to be scared all day huh. long. And then that added pressure of like, yeah, this is your last opportunity. And we would get out there, we do one snow check, and I was like, well, snow feels pretty good, so let's go hit this like kind of warm up line. And I see this like cliff, and it was like a, I thought about a 20 footer. I was like, I'll go hit that, and I pop off of it. And because scale is something super hard to figure out in Alaska, it ended up being like a 60 footer. <laughs> so I like pop off this thing, and I was like, oh my God, I'm, this cliff was way bigger than I thought. And I stomped in the most perfect snow you could ever ever imagine, and it was game on. Uh, I was up there with Henrik Winstead, Scott Gaffney, Steve Reska, and we proceeded to film 13 lines that day, which hmm. if that, for a pro skier, if you're really, really lucky, you'll get four film lines in one day, and that's how you make your segment. So the fact we had 13, hmm was just bananas. And like I had guides calling me into lines that had like 500 foot cliffs below them. And they're like, yeah, you're good. The snow is super locked up. It's as perfect as it gets. And we, Henrik and I just were like teed off like I've never hmm. thought possible. And that was like the first trip I was like, oh, so this is what Alaska is, should be like. This is what it's like in the films. The first two trips weren't like that. And then I realized it never was like that ever again in like <laughs> 10 more trips. It was definitely the most special single day of skiing I've ever had in my life. Hmm. Well done. Trevor, I'm, I really want to start with today because I'm curious because I, I, I don't know who it was on our team um, but was like, hey, uh, Taylor Ahern and Trevor are on Rambo. I was like, cool. What? And uh, I just want to hear a bit about um, how you, where you entered, how you got in, how you sized it up, what you thought. Uh, Jonathan, thanks for having me here. I mm -hmm. really appreciate it. Um, yeah, it was uh, going down R Rambo. Rainbow? Rainbow? Yeah. Rainbow. Rainbow. <laughs> Rainbow. Yeah. Rainbow. Uh, you know, I had my machete to chop down some trees in there, but <laughs> no, it was it was more so like coming into it. It was I I think I saw Drew's line the other day and it was just kind of like hop on rocks to like get down the first fifteen feet. And then once I was in there it was, you know, it was definitely steep, but at the same time it was like um the snow was really good, and it was just fun to be in there, honestly. So, um, but yeah, I entered on like the left and just cut hard right, and then just keep the right side. So, I'm not gonna name names right now, but it was um, it was either last summit or the one before that. But a certain pro skier who shall not be named right now, we were skiing Rambo, and he was just like you guys are just psycho. Like, what are you even doing? Oh, he, he was from Utah, Cody. Um, 
I mean, that's just true. It is true. But um, so anyway, I like that Trevor's just like, what's the name of this thing? I don't know. That looks fun. And uh, yeah. So. Well, I'm from the East Coast, so it's like, it definitely had snow on it. So might as well go ski, right? <laughs> Trevor, the other thing is, um, you literally just were in Japan, basically came from Japan to Crested Butte. Um, so I haven't even had a chance to really ask. T tell me how the Japan trip went. Uh, yeah, the Japan trip was amazing. We got some good snow, but I mean, every time I've, I've gone there twice now, and uh, next year I want to go back for like the whole month. Um, but every time I go, it's literally the people, the culture, the food, and then it's like, oh yeah, the skiing is so amazing. And uh, I ate so much sushi, ramen, and uh, some Wagyu beef. Let's go. <laughs> you, you think you might try to get back? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, next year, I'm definitely going to go for like a whole month or three weeks to a month for okay. sure. Okay. Um, Teton. You talked a bit about good, great kind of line up to sort of the present where you are. I think where, where I really first um, started seeing or hearing about you seeing your stuff was you just flashing big lines in the Jackson side country, big cliffs, big lines. And uh, maybe along the lines of the question I asked Cody, um, just walk us through um, a line that comes to mind um, that was particularly memorable or kind of stand out for you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I'd probably, so those of you who have skied in the Jackson Hole side country, this is a classic line. It's called Once is Enough right <laughs> off the um, south side of Cody Peak. Um, it's a couloir, uh, but there's this huge, like, picturesque fin on the southern side of the couloir. Um, and I've probably skied it like five or six times in my life. And, but I'd never like aired off the edge of the fin. And I always like looked at it. I've been looking at it for like five or six years. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wow, that would be so cool. Like I've never seen anyone do it. Um, but the conditions had to be like just right. And I had to like study it really well. So last year I was like super gung-ho on making it happen um, so I like flew my drone all around it um, like took pictures from every location um, and then just kind of hoped that the conditions would line up and I visualized it a ton of times and one morning it's like negative 10 degrees up there and I get to the top and like it's just you look at the snow and it's perfect like you can just tell it's like it's like cold smoke, you know, just like popping up in the air. It's, it's just, you couldn't get a better scenario. Um, so I got on top of it and there was like a cornice, um, like definitely bigger than I was hoping for. Um, so I like, and I couldn't really tell how big it was. So I pulled out my um, probe and was like smacking it from like 10 feet away, <laughs> trying to figure out like how big it was. Cause I was like, I was probing it too, but I couldn't really figure out where it stopped. Um, but I got to a point where I could like barely see over it. And it was only like a five foot drop, but into like a 50 degree slope. And then as you make your n next turn, you got to hop over like a five foot cliff band into a no fall zone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Where like, I don't think anyone's made a turn there before, which is wild in Jackson. Um, and then you take another turn and you're on the fin. Two more turns, then you're hopping off the fin and it's a double out. So you got two more like 10 foot cliffs you gotta jump off um, from there. And as soon as I get to that air, um, the cold smoke like from the slough hits me and just completely mm. blinds me. Um, and so I had a moment where I was like, all right, I'm either gonna just bail on this line that I've been dreaming of forever and I've visualized a hundred times, or I'm just gonna trust my like visualiz vi visualization and just go for it. And that's what I did, like a split second decision. 
Uh, and it worked out. I came through the cloud and I just, with just enough time to spot my landing uh, and landed and was able to make it over the next cliff. And as I'm coming out, there's just this huge, enormous cloud of uh, like, looks like an avalanche, but it's just a huge slough cloud. And I was able to just like kind of ski right around it. It was just this surreal experience of like stomping my favorite line and um, just coming out super beautiful and just made it to the bottom. Felt amazing. Hmm. I think I want to put this to all of you. We'll start with you, Hoji, but this whole thing of like skiing gnarly stuff blind, I actually, we've probably talked about this at some point along the way, but I actually think that's maybe one of the real keys that maybe differentiates pro skiers from like the rest of us because the minute I get a little bit of snow on my goggles, I'm like, you know, basically tempted to immediately stop and shut things down. And I, you know, you see, we see this now all the time, especially with POV footage and everything just kind of whites out and the rest. Um, Hoji, thoughts on this, the kind of skiing blind thing, and as Teton said, just trusting visualization? Or, or do, you, do you kind of agree with what I'm talking about? Like that being a, maybe a bit of a unique quality or characteristic among some of the very best to do it? Yes. Sweet. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I mean, it's a, like a survival instinct, you know? And that, that was a great description. But the survival instinct would be stop. Yeah, yeah, the survival instinct is always stop. Okay. But you open the next beer. And... <laughs> uh, at first, I thought you yeah. said open the next sphere, and I was like, we're getting metaphysical. Oh, no, no. no. <laughs> we're not. Okay, no, but it's, uh, yeah, it's like listening to Teton's story. It's like the thing that I think gets, it's, it's hard to, you can't put it in the, the films or whatever, but it's like he studied that line. He's flying a drone. I don't, it's amazing what, what you can do with the modern technology. Like, um, but you, the visualization, which probably you learned in ski racing, that's what I pulled hmm. that skill set hmm. from in my journey. And it's like, you have to, if you really want to do that and get to there, you have to be so prepared mentally and so like trusting on your experience. Like I can make that turn, I can get to there. And like, of course you don't want to be blinded, but it's powder because if it wasn't, it wouldn't be in the film. And, and that like split second reaction to like trust in, in all the work that you've done to prepare yourself for that is, is definitely one of the key elements of, yeah, being a pro skier to film lines. Um, so it was, a, yeah, it was a perfect description. Like I was just listening to it relating 100%. Like it's, but you, I, I find that, especially as I age out here, it's like the longer you have to really digest and like come up with that plan and visualize and like, especially when you're skiing at your absolute limit, um, the, the better off, like the better at the top when you, when you commit to that, you, you almost can go into this autopilot flow state, whatever they call it. And, uh, and you have to rely on your vis visualization. Mm -hmm. Cody? Yeah, there's a few things. Like when we were filming and free ride filming, we used to live by a mantra that Hoji once said, is like, if you're not scared, it's not gonna make the movie. And that was dead true. And I think we, a lot of people still use that, but- um, That was it, you. you is that no, true? I think, I believe Hugo told me that. Oh, Hugo, yeah. Well, yeah. even better. Yeah. Um, but, the, the skiing blind thing is like, it's one of the most critical things about trying to be a big mountain line skier. And there's a reason why the best big mountain line skiers aren't in their 20s, because it takes so much experience to be able to be on the opposite side of a face you wanna ski from an unknown distance with no landmarks like a tree to figure out the scale of things 
to then look at it from afar and go like, okay, this that little nub is probably gonna look like actually like a giant tower when I get up to it, but, and try and figure out your, how you're gonna ski it, put this line mapped out together so you're gonna be avoiding your slough, hit the features you wanna ski, and then you get to the top and then you can't see any of it. Like you see the first 10 feet. And hmm. I know this, uh, I almost get preempted. I know you have a question about the most scared you've ever been in the mountains. Well. That goes to that same ski day that I had up in Alaska that I talked about the greatest day ever. We were skiing this zone, this peak called Peak 6500 out of Girdwood um, with CPG. And <clears throat> we started off in the zone and Henrik and I skied some lines just to the like lookers right. And immediately there was this kind of line that I saw and it was very obvious, but this cliff looked gigantic. like really really big and I just was like I'm not even going to bring that line up because it's like way too scary and the thing is you bring it up yeah, among your friends and film crew you're pretty committed by that point and so we warmed up on these other airs and we were hitting these like 20 foot airs with speed but going like 60 70 feet and we get to the bottom of we filmed like two or three lines and I they're like all right so you guys good any more lines and I'm sitting there I'm like don't bring it up don't bring it up don't bring it up and then all of a sudden I was like well there's one more line I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> who said that <laughs> and by then like the film crew and everyone else is like yeah yeah we saw that too <laughs> we're like god damn it so um get to the top of this line and <clears throat> it's about a 2500 to 3000 foot face like really big in scale and it was a complete bowling ball. Like it broke away on three sides mm. and all you see is like a rollover for about 20 feet and then it looks like it goes so steep that it looks like you're about to ski off a 2000 foot cliff. And this line goes into a single mono spine where <clears throat> because of the slough and getting to it, I knew that when I'm on this spine, there's no exiting. Like, you're, there's gonna be slough on both sides, so you can't hit the eject button. You are completely committed. And then that single monospine ended and what ended up being about an 80 foot cliff face. So like really, really big. When then you add in the steeps and everything. And I just, I was so scared at the top of this line. It's the only time I've done this in my life. Like in a, in a film situation, when we're you know, timing up cameras, we count people in. So you're like, all right, dropping in 10 seconds. And there's a long process to get there, letting the cameras know you're getting closer. And it's just getting over this hump to say like, okay, I, I think I'm ready. And they're like, all right, 10 seconds. <clears throat> and I remember just looking down this line and just feeling like it's about to ski off a 2,500 foot cliff. And it's just like so scared that I turned around completely and looked up to the sky behind me as they counted me in and I went they were like three two one dropping and I just pushed off while looking away <laughs> <laughs> because I was so like I couldn't get my mind to like want to go yeah. off a 2,000 foot cliff <laughs> it looked like suicide and I was just like I just knew that I'm like once I'm in you're in and you'll, you'll figure it out. You'll be in that flow state, you'll, you'll figure it out. And yeah, I pushed off and ended up being like the opening line of that segment. And still, in my opinion, hmm. my favorite line I've ever skied in my huh. life. Um, it was like landing an 80 foot cliff with slough roaring all around you, like just coming off that cliff and being feeling like, oh my God, this cliff is huge, <laughs> like way bigger than I thought. <laughs> And like stomping and skiing out, like if I would have fallen, I would have fallen in this like pretty catcher's mid crevasse. It was only about a 10 foot wide exit. And yeah, that was by far like the epitome of like decades of experience working my way through competitions, couple of years in Alaska and just feeling like you're figuring this out. And <clears throat> yeah, I think it was 30 when that happened or 20, 29. We mm -hmm. were just figuring out like how to ski in Alaska. Hmm. I wasn't. I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> but you can you can describe that so yeah. clearly. Yeah. What is it? Twelve years later, you yeah, know? Totally. like that's how that speaks to this. You know, like we could all we all have these moments, and and that's like really what it takes. Hmm. Which can I ask him about yeah. the rail to rail backflip? Yeah. Because 
Have you guys, has, who's seen Full Circle here? Uh, shout out to Josh Berman, director of Full Circle. <clears throat> um, man, yeah, that was, uh, all right, going back to, you know, seeing slough and not even slough, but like just like powdering your Skin face. Blind. <laughs> oh my God. Like, I'm so we jealous of you guys because <laughs> I'm, sit I'm straight up sitting and I'm like, is that Cliff over there? And then like you go over and it's just yeah. a little roller. But it, it's just mind boggling. Like when I, you know, when uh, heli skiing or cat skiing, like having, um, you know, a spotter or someone that can actually understand like what's going on and everything and be like, all right, hey, like over this roller, like you're good. Um, you know, cause when you're in the heli, you know, you get one quick look at it and you're like, all right, let's go ski this. I'm like, well, I can't really turn on one ski as well as you guys can with two, just navigating on pillows and stuff. And I just remember uh, one of my first times with Casey Dean, he was like, oh yeah, get on this pillow and turn. And I'm like, dude, I just go straight, man. <laughs> and, uh, it was, yeah, it, so just a little context for that, like uh, having a spotter and just having someone like with you that understands, like you can't not see. And like people will be like, oh, do you see that? I'm like, guys, I like literally just get on your knees or like yeah. sit on the ground and then tell me what you see. So it's, it's definitely challenging, but um, it's super helpful having a spotter and like understanding where you're skiing. But yeah, the rail to rail backflip um, was probably the, like one of my hardest things that I've ever done and probably I won't ever do it again. Um, <laughs> And I to do it again and get it a little better, and I told him no. I, <laughs> <laughs> yes, all right. So, how many people have ever done that in this room? I, I, how many people do you think on two skis have done it? I think a hand, handful, like 10, less eight, than five, eight people, 10 people. I don't know. Half dozen, half dozen six people, if I do the math right. <laughs> so, nice. So, it was just really cool. I'm, I'm with my good buddy, Burke Irving, who's a half pipe. Red Bull athlete and looking at him, I'm like, yo, you're gonna hit this? He's like, hell no, dude, I won't hit this. But the whole backstory of, you know, me wanting to try this, I was like, I, I can flip off a rail. Like, I, I love rails. This is like something that's very comfortable and it feels very good once you complete a rail, hit the snow. And for me, it was just like, all right, I, I'm pretty sure if we get this rail and set it up like a jump, I, I know I could backflip it. And what year was it, 2022? We, we shot the first one, or maybe 2021? 2021 when we did the first rail. And I did it like three, four times. I look at Berman, I'm like, yeah, let's put it in the box. And it's like, I'm like, ha, 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 you know? And then it goes, like in the movie, it cuts to a year later. And I just remember us all looking at the, the feature, and I'm with a couple buddies in the park builder, I'm looking at it, I'm like, this is way bigger than last year. I'm like, just, it just looks bigger. I'm intimidated just to like go hit the rail and backflip it. We go to the rail yard to go pick out the rail. And I just remember like Josh and Devin, they were like, no, dude, you should get something a little wider. And I was like, nope, this skinny rail that fits four inches, my ski length or width, I want to land on that. And it was like, what, 30 feet or something long. And I was like, this is the rail. And they were just like, dude, get a box, something a little wider so you can land on it. I was like, no, it wouldn't look as cool. And two, <laughs> I want to legit do this. And, um, you know, just going from like all these, you know, Candide videos and just watching all these amazing athletes, you know, do all these, uh, you know, acts. I was like, all right, I'm 100% I'm myself that I can do this. Hmm. And I just remember you set up the rail and I'm, practicing the backflip, um, launching it off, and Devin's literally um, spraying orange spray paint in the landing. And there's like 10 orange dots, and they're like left, right, left. <laughs> like, it's not in a straight line. <laughs> and um, before, before that, we get to like the 10th one, I like look at him after like three or four like hits off the rail. I'm like, yo, did you guys film that? And they're like, no, we didn't film it. I'm like, come on, I need like something. I know I backflipped off the rail last year and we're gonna do this, but you know, give me a little, uh, little pep, you know, and like respect on this. And uh, it was just super funny. They, and then we started filming and I just had such a good rip off the rail and the exact landing I wanted to land on the rail. And I was pushing three to four times, every single time consistently into this rail. 
once we put in the rail, the down rail, I basically pushed six times, seven times. So I, I wanted to land right in the middle. But in my mind, I was like, if I come up short, this is not going to be good. I'm not going to able to try my goal again. And I've been thinking about this for like probably three to four years mm -hmm. before even like attempting this. And I know it's mind boggling, but like I just knew I had the visualization of doing this uh, over and over and over again. And, you know, going back to like, you know, mapping out your your lines and all that. And it's like, you know, skiing and super steep stuff when it's just deep. And I'm like, all right, I hope I'm there's not a tree there. Like, all right, we memorize it a little bit. But then you're turning and you're like, oh, yeah, it's sick. I'm good. But so like going from there to, you know, just all my tricks, I can't speed check. Um, it's, it's very, very hard to speed check. I only have one ski. Um, so yeah, so for me, it was kind of just like knowing exactly what I needed to do. And yeah, I just remember after doing that, it was one of the most insane feelings in the world. But looking at the whole crew, I was like, are you sure I'm good to go? Do I need to go do it again? Everyone was like, no, you're good to go. And I ended it on that, which is super amazing. And I think I hit the table four times. You did. You owe us like a thousand <laughs> drinks. <laughs> sure. so, yeah. so just, just a couple follow-ups. Um, We've, Trevor, we've had a um, couple of blister podcasts that we've done. And so go find the, the two that we've done together. But I did, we won't go back to it right now. But in one of those conversations, Trevor went into a bit more detail about when you're in a sit ski, you know, you're hearing all these incredible skiers talk about being scared at the top of a line. Shrink your field of vision you know, basically in half in the sit ski and whether you're sizing up a cliff or seeing like what the landing looks like or like the, the, the like exponential um, nature of the problem that comes up by doing this stuff in a sit ski and still doing stuff where we're like everybody's eye pop, eyes are popping out. It's wild, like not subtle not a subtle difference. And we kind of moved through that part fast, but I remember just thinking the way you walked us through it in one of our previous conversations was pretty amazing. Now, Cody already kind of broached the, you know, moment you were most scared moment on top of the line. I'm starting to have a theory about you that like, maybe like you and Alex Honnold, like, <laughs> right? I mean, like there might be something slightly different. I hate heights. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot different right there. So, how often do you end do you end up backing off of a line where maybe some of the folks you're out filming with are like, actually, we think you've got this. Like, have, do you ever do that? Because man, it seems like maybe the answer is almost never. Um, no, no, no. I I always say calculated risk and understanding like. Um, what's in your landing, you know, I, I can't just like stop super quick if there's a tree in the landing. So like if there's just some hits that I cannot do, like I'll be so honest and upfront. It's like, I can't do that. Like I need something different for me. Um, but yeah, you know, if the snow quality is not right, you're mentally not right, physically not right. Like there's no point to go hit this, you know, just in front of the cameras. It's more so it's like, um, you know, I want to live another day. I want to keep skiing for the rest of my life. So it's like kind of like regrouping, bringing it back to, um, you know, always thinking about that line. And then when it lines up right, you go, go back and hit it and um, go chase your dreams, you know. Mm -hmm. I want to switch up because we, we did this last year and I, we, we went through some of these questions and I don't, while I don't think either of you probably remember exactly some of your answers, the one that I'm tempted to ask you about is your most starstruck moment. Star, star, star. Do you say that in Yeah, yeah no, no, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I can translate. Um, yeah, I mean, there's been many over the years, of course. Like, you, you build up these heroes and... Uh, you know, that's part of the inspiration of, of life and skiing and many things. But uh, I, the time when I grew up <clears throat> in the 90s, 
um, when skiing really had like a radical, radical shift. Everything changed uh, so much. And uh, I was at the perfect age to, to receive the propaganda of like the twin tip and the new Canadian Air Force. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I had a, a, I was obsessed with, with, with what was going on there and it drastically changed the path of my life mm -hmm. and uh, thankfully. Um, but I watched those old films, VHS, till they were no longer able to be watched. And uh, I think the best moment I, I had was uh, years later, um, got the opportunity to work at the High North ski camp uh, up on the Blackcomb Glacier when it was still there. And, uh, and I ended up getting to really spend some time and, and, uh, and get to ski with my like absolute idol, uh, JP Eau Claire. Mm -hmm. And like I had his, the poster, the 1080 poster, 360 mute grab and like, this was just it. And like, it wasn't a moment, but it was just this like opportunity to get to know the guy who changed your life. And he was such a amazing human. So, so, so much passion and just like give, give time to anyone at any point throughout the day with all the kids and all the coaches. And um, yeah, just having that opportunity. And we used to go every day at lunch break and just do like backflip trains, him and I like through the big, the big line big jumps and like just doing like following him off the big jump and he's just laying it out and like talking about different techniques or backflips and and uh yeah it was for me that was like that was i met my hero and he was so much cooler than i could ever imagine hmm. and i treasure those memories hmm. i want to open this up to audience questions um if any of you have some of those but uh Titan, I think I want to ask you that same question. Starstruck moment. Um, you know, I was thinking about it in my head, and while I do think it's like it's always a special experience to um, meet p skiers that you've looked up to, I, like especially these two guys right here who've been paving the way for a while, um, total legends, um, and I, and I thoroughly enjoy those moments where I get to meet some awesome skiers. Um, I was thinking about it and this story of meeting Harrison Ford popped into my head. <laughs> so I figured I'd tell that story. Um, it was like my first year in Jackson and I was ski bumming it and working um, a service industry job waiting tables. And Harrison Ford owns a house in Jackson and he like came into the restaurant and he's with his family and it's his birthday, but they're like being oddly quiet. And I, you know, I wanted to say something to him, but I like didn't want to disrupt their evening. Um, and I just didn't really know what to say. <laughs> and so I kind of just like went through the whole night pretending I didn't know who he was, which is <laughs> not the way to go about it. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, it gets to the end of the night. God, I just did not handle this well. And uh, <laughs> and I'm I'm <laughs> handing them the check, and I like this line from Star Wars that Han Solo said <laughs> popped into my head, and I like handed them the check, and then I was like, well, don't everyone thank me all at once. <laughs> and nobody laughed. And <laughs> I was like, okay, bye. I just walked away. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was embarrassing. <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, Carl? I don't know if you guys can answer this because of who you are, but I love to ski, and I have similar experiences maybe to some of the things you guys have described. And I'm just curious if you have any insight into how your remarkable experiences correlate to those of us more normal skiers? I'd personally say they're the exact same. Like, I, 
you know, there goes that old saying, it's like the best skier in the mountains, the skier having the most fun, mm -hmm. which is ultimately 100% true. Because like, if I'm going out there and bitching about conditions and meanwhile, the person behind me is like, this is so fun, mm -hmm. then like, I'm not doing good at skiing that day. Um, <clears throat> because in, yeah, you can make a better turn or do a better air or something like that. But if that person behind you is having more fun, then they're winning. Um, because that's kind of the whole point of why we do this. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, like, I look at it just everything's on the exact same scale. Like, mm -hmm. the challenges that me and my friends put ourselves up to when we were 13 years old, whether it was you're like, all right, there's this cliff in Palisades called Ice Goddess, and it was kind of a test piece, and we stood on top of it, like, multiple times and then stood on top of it for like 20 minutes and egging each other on to like, I'll hit it if you hit it and then you're scouting it and then you finally jump off of it and it's this big leap forward. And it's like a 25 foot cliff to a flat landing. And at that time it was like the most incredible feeling I've ever had. That same feeling I've had when I did that line I described of being so scared on, like it's the same thing. And so it's kind of like, to me, like sure, some of these athletes that you watch at the highest level doing just bananas stuff, like the sensations they're getting out of it, the challenge they're getting out of it is the same as like a beginner skier on a 10th day going up to their first blue run and like yeah. making a good carve down. And so like, that's ultimately, well, even though I answered the question of my favorite ski day ever, like ultimately it's really hard to say because I look back at that experience of being 13 years old and it was like so special. And it was jumping off a 25 foot cliff, like something that hundreds of thousands of people have done. So to me, it's, I don't know, we all share the same experiences and going to that like starstruck feeling, like I still get tripped out that people think we're stars because I feel like I'm just a skier and everyone else in here is the exact same as me. We're all doing the exact same stuff, just going out there, having fun, mm -hmm. figuring out ways to challenge ourselves or do something unique and find a good turn and laugh about it with your friends at the end of the day. t -Town, does that resonate with you? Totally. Yeah. I mean, I could talk on that, but I think, I honestly think Cody just yeah hit the nail on the head there. I think that seems like one of the coolest things about sort of these outdoor sports, whether it's skiing, mountain biking, whatever, that thing where you're a little bit on the edge of nervousness or something, or sometimes downright scared. And then, and then you do it or you walk away, but then that just, it's the same. It's just, we can maybe ratchet up what the new thing takes to be a little scared or, you know, feeling a bit of nervousness. And so we'll take your word for it, um, you know? I'm curious to glean some insight from you guys about this inverse relationship between our minds, you know, which will never plateau and this wisdom that continues, but our bodies being on the decline. And how do you weave that together? Because, you know, we, this wisdom just continues. You get better and better as a skier, but our bodies maybe don't keep up. Hoji doesn't know because he's still pinnacle Hoji right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. I mean, I, I, uh, this is a very valid question for me because, and probably Cody too, you guys are a bit younger. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's like, I think of it all the time, you know, like I just reflect to like my, what I thought when I was at the absolute, like my prime, you know, last night. Uh, <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, it's like, it's really tough because you, you, you are sitting in a, in a fortunate position to have all this experience and knowledge and be able to reflect and, and try and like push forward. And it's so helpful compared to the 20 year olds or whatever. But I always think back to like when I was that age and like nothing hurt and I never saw any tragedies and, and like everything was just like on this fucking rocket ship to the moon. Could I even like, I couldn't even be in a junior comp or something by today's standards. So it's like, a, it's a really tricky, it's, it's like a psychological game there. And like the experience is priceless and yeah, your body is timing out and you're trying to understand like, where was your peak 
And, uh, but that's actually one of the things I love about skiing the most is that you can evolve as a skier, as a person, and like you just keep finding new, new things that kind of are achievable. Like I'm not gonna go out there and outdo Sam Cooch on a, on a matchstick film trip or something, but I can do other things that maybe he isn't at the stage. Uh, like it's just a different thing. So it's kind of like self-reflection and evolution of, of, of what you want out of life if you're fortunate enough to have that opportunity. Anything to add, Cody? I'm actually more curious to hear from you. Because yes. You no, without a doubt. I'm 31. I'll be 32 this summer. But uh, I've been in a wheelchair for nine and a half years. And I swear to God, some days I feel like I'm 60. Hmm. Just in the sense of like, I'm literally sitting. And then I'm sitting again in a sit ski all day. Um, you know, like, yeah, sure. Five years ago, I was you know, a little bit more pain free. But I've noticed like as time goes on and or I'm spending more time in a wheelchair, I'm getting more and more tight, more and more sore, my back's hurting more and more. Um, so, you know, I, I know I'm not gonna be able to like throw backflips the rest of my life as much as I would want to. It's more so it's like, how can I find that like peace and happiness of with what I'm doing and what I'm capable in my body. But um, I mean, shit, man. I mean, I'm sure you guys have those off days where you guys don't wanna get out of bed and just relax and you need, you need recovery. I mean, I think that's so important. Like charging right you charge so hard but as important it is like you need to have that recovery and stretching going to the gym and i've gotten three shoulder surgeries before my back surgery so uh all through high school i was in junior olympic swimming and then from there it was like shit i'm in a wheelchair for the rest of my life what do i do and um went to the gym and i had a trainer that literally got my shoulders so good and so right so i can do uh so i can live life and i can push my wheelchair um, but yeah, I've, I've definitely noticed like getting older, or, you know, just as year by year, just your body takes such a toll. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll ski forever the rest of my life. And that's kind of like where it goes back to that calculator risk of, is it smart to hit this with no snow or even if there's cameras on or not, mm -hmm. it's just kind of like having that mentality of like, all right, this might be cool, but at the same time, I'd rather ski, you know, have that longevity of skiing. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's where I'm at with all that. Yeah. Next question. Who or what are you looking at for inspiration right now? Teton. Um, <clears throat> that is a good question. <laughs> um, you know, I've actually been, I don't even surf, but I've been watching a lot of uh, surf videos just to get inspiration for making short films on YouTube. Uh, I, I just like, I really enjoy watching a lot of these guys, what they're doing and, and kind of like their style of editing. Um, so I've been kind of like diving into that and trying to see ways where it um, crosses over and where it could cross over into the mm -hmm. ski world. I, I would say mine's actually less sport related at this time of my life. Although like almost every skier out there that's in a film or as a photo, I've like take some inspiration from just because I enjoy watching skiing and skiers and their twists and creativity to it. But um, ultimately, like this goes back to that aging thing is like, hey, what, what do you, what do you want to do with the, with your declining athletic status? <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of it to me is like, how can you have more of a positive impact and leave the mountains or the ski communities or skiers in a better place than when you found it. So looking, I mean, people like Connor Ryan are a huge inspiration for me. Uh, Len Nessifer is a huge inspiration for me. People that are like kind of doing more from this world and actually having an impact that can change the way the, or change the way or change the direction that our mountain communities are currently in. Um, that's kind of who I'm taking more mm -hmm. inspiration from these days of trying to figure out like, yeah, the, the old cabin rule, which is leave the place better than you found it. How can we, how can we do that? Coach? I live in a bubble. <laughs> <I'm> Self-focused. 
Yeah, that, that's actually the, the root of it is like, wow, I've been really selfish for 40 years. <laughs> how can I figure out how to maybe be a slightly less selfish? <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, events like this and, and just like, I, I, I actually get a, a real pleasure out of, I mean, guess this is inspirational, but just like, deal, like interacting with people and helping them and like, because that's been the, the path of my life. I didn't get here without all the help and the, the mentorship or whatever it may be. So like, at the moment, I, I enjoy all of these interactions that we're in. Yeah. Um, I don't have a specific mentor that, that's showing me the way to do that, but I'm, I'm just trying to like put it out there and be like myself and be genuine and, and, and yeah, just I love communicating with yeah. everyone. Um, didn't really answer the question, I'm sorry, but mm. that's my philosophy right yeah. now. <laughs> Trevor. Um, shout out to Colleen. Uh, it was my first instructor here at Crescent Butte yeah. when I first learned how to sit ski. <laughs> Super, super thankful for her, and we got to share some laps today, which mm. is really special. Um, but yeah, I remember uh, being uh, like laid up in 2014, and then watching Art of Flight, and then it's kind of surreal. Of <laughs> you know, I I went to Corbett's not knowing a single soul. I didn't have a crew. I didn't have anyone. I literally drove up there, and um, yeah, ma I made it happen. But you know, super thankful for uh, Travis Rice to like help me with. Corbett's super, super lucky. Um, you know, uh, had nothing to do with skiing, but um, inspiration for my sister in the sense of like, she worked so hard her whole life. Mm. And for me, I was kind of, uh, I worked hard, but I, I was very like athletically gifted. And so for me to like, after my injury, it was like, no one's gonna do this for you. So you have to do this yourself. And I took all that from her, which I saw as a kid and put it into my own, you know, own basket. Um, and then also, you know, I think getting a lot of inspo from Candide, um, but yeah, um, yeah, that's what I would say mm -hmm. for sure. Well, that is our time. Um, what a pleasure to have y'all up here and sharing stories. So thank you all.